I get to introduce Hannah Carney, who is one of the most decorated World Cup athletes of all time, with Olympic gold and bronze medals, three world championship victories, and a record tying 46, 46 World Cup wins. In, 2000, in 2012, she also set a record for the most consecutive World Cup victories with a streak of 16 straight wins. Hannah also happens to have graduated from Hanover High School. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Hannah Carney. Thank you for that warm welcome. How are we doing, New Hampshire? <laughs> I, hear, I saw some tired was sort of a bold, uh, bold one up there. So we'll try to increase the energy levels, lighten it up a little bit. We've been talking about some serious uh, topics today. I'm just gonna talk about sports and myself. That's what I know best. So I hope you guys are in for the ride here. My name is Hannah. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And I did go to Hanover High School. I heard some marauders in the house. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Um, this is the story. Well, first, I guess I'll start with what I did. I was a freestyle mogul skier. Um, I feel like this audience, I feel confident that most people know what freestyle skiing is, but not everyone. So I put together a few photos. That is mogul skiing. It's bumps and two jumps. Uh, those happen to be the two tricks that I chose to perform. Some audiences have no idea what skiing is, so I'm glad to be back in New Hampshire, back in New England. This is the story of my life growing up in New England. I'm gonna call it Vermont slash New Hampshire because on February 26th, I won't say the year, I was born at the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in Hanover, New Hampshire. <laughs> However, my house and my parents lived in Norwich, Vermont. So I'm a pr product of Vermont slash New Hampshire. And this is the story of my life in New England, my career in sport, the pressures I felt and put on myself, the goals I set, of which there were a lot, the decisions I made and all of the now what moments, and the support that I had, because it's an individual sport. I got one gold medal, but a lot of people helped me get there. I got into the sport of skiing because my parents made me. I literally do not remember learning how to ski. You guys live around here. What else are you going to do in the winter? This was before the internet, this was before e-games, and there was definitely no Instagram. So we skied. My parents put my little two-year-old body in a horse halter and pushed me down the slopes, and I loved it. I loved the feeling of the wind in my face and the freedom of being on the slopes. You know the mittens that like attach through your, on a string? I would just let them dangle so I could feel more of the wind, not only in my face, but on my hands. I don't, now, I don't have the circulation for that. That'd be freezing. Clearly, I didn't really have very much style but I loved the sport. And my parents knew that I loved the sport, and my dad built me a jump in the backyard. I told you, I like the wind in my face. And I, looking back now, I guess this is where the 10,000 hours started. This is how my training started. But guess what? It did not feel like training. It was fun. This was a, my dad set up a light in the backyard and built me that jump. Marked, the jump is marked by two plastic hockey sticks. Um, not hard to believe, my brother is now a semi-professional hockey player. Um, we were a really sporty family, and that's how we spent our time together and before and after school. I liked it so much that I signed up for the Ford Sayer, which was at the Dartmouth Ski Way, after school skiing program. How many of you guys have some opportunity to go skiing through your school or get hit? That's awesome. That's really, really cool, or did before you were in high school and had all sorts of serious things you had to deal with. That's really cool, um, and that's unique to our state. And one of my themes, I'm just gonna, a lesson now, is to take advantage of the opportunities that are available to you growing up in such a cool region that uh, respects and appreciates uh, winter sports. So when I joined the freestyle program, I was so young and shy that my mom joined with me. I didn't want to do it by myself. I was only about eight years old, and it was back when freestyle skiing was ballet skiing, Long poles, short skis, you dance around. A video goes viral, like every Olympics. Like, look, this used to be a sport. Mogul skiing and aerials. And I loved it. During this time, as I mentioned I was shy, I was also trying other sports. And uh, specifically, my mother bribed me into trying these sports. But the main difference between it being my parents pressuring me to play sports was that the bribe only lasted for all I had to do was make it through one practice or one race or one soccer game. I just had to try 
the sport to get the soccer shorts or the running shoes or the chocolate chip cookie. It was just a, it was just a bribe to try it. And then from that point on, the decision was my own. Uh, did you like that practice? Do you want to keep playing? And the answer was yes. So I became, through bribery, a soccer player and a track athlete, as well as a skier because I loved the friends that I made in those sports, and I loved the activity, a team sport balancing out the individual pursuit of freestyle skiing. And so this whole time I was in school in Vermont slash New Hampshire, I played all the sports because that's what I enjoyed. When I was 12, I qualified for my first competition that was going to involve a plane ticket, a flight somewhere, and plane tickets are expensive. And so we had a decision to make. My dad was a carpenter, and my mom was the recreation director in Norwich, Vermont. We didn't have a ton of extra money to be buying plane tickets. And so my parents included me in the process of, and asked me if this was something that I really wanted to do. I said yes, and I contributed my money from, I don't know if I actually contributed money, that makes a good story. They probably bought me the plane ticket. But the plan from that point going forward was that how was I going to get support? How was I going to ask for help for this um, pursuit that I believed in, which was following my skiing career? So I put together a resume. It was pretty pathetic. Um, I had worked at an ice cream stand. I'd taken care of people's horses. And I'd done some babysitting. I was much better with the animals than I was with the people. And that was my resume, including my grades from school. And I went around to local businesses and got a little bit of help, $100 here, a free pair of ski poles here. And then the letter fell in the hands of someone on the recreation council with my mother. And his father, for the next five years, even though I never met him, he was a philanthropist who supported me, my career, wholeheartedly. Um, all he asked for was a budget and the receipts and the, uh, held me accountable to the money I was spending on entry fees and training costs and plane tickets, and then my report card. And so I quickly learned the value of uh, accountability and um, of money, because I was in control of those finances and I was responsible for the money, and then to study hard. So yes, that put some pressure on me to get good grades, because I knew that there was a connection between my good grades and getting money for the sport that I loved. But I was already putting tons of pressure on myself, so that was no problem. For example, when I was a sophomore in high school, I was, let's see, so January of my, no, February of my sophomore year, studying for midterm exams. It was the night before my algebra midterm, and I got a phone call. And because I had gone to some competitions further outside of the state, I had been exposed to a higher level competition. This US ski team coaches had seen me ski, and they thought she could be good at this sport someday. And so they called my house, my landline. And when I answered the phone, I, even though I was in the, I, my parents answered the phone because I was in the middle of studying, I said, can we talk to Hannah? And they said, it's 2002, the Salt Lake City Olympics are being hosted in just another two weeks or so, would you like to come forerun? And forerun means test out the event uh, before you don't get to compete, but you get to go down the course, you get to ski with the best competitors in the world and uh, ski on the same course they do and test the timing and the judges get to practice. And the reaction that I had was so emotional and so enthusiastic that I was incapable of studying for the rest of the night. I called everyone I knew to tell them the good news. I was sobbing tears of joy and I got a really bad grade on that midterm the next day. So much so that I got one of my only two A minuses in all of high school and I am still upset about it. <laughs> but I have no regrets because I got to go to my first international competition even though I wasn't competing, I got to see the best skiers in the entire world. I watched an American win a silver medal, and I saw what it would take to win a gold, to be the best in the world. And I was like, these women are strong. They know how to do more difficult tricks, but they're not that good. So I went home, and it was February break. I went to Waterville Valley, where I was a weekend skier. And during that week, I crashed a lot of times on a 360, a helicopter, a rotation. And I learned a new trick. And that kind of changed my career. That moment of being exposed to the best in the world and knowing what it was going to take changed my life. And two weeks after I learned a new trick, I won Junior World Championships in Finland and made the US ski team. So now I'm a member of the US ski team, but I'm also just a sophomore in high school. So I have some decisions to make. As you can imagine, there was a lot of pressure to go to a ski academy. Obviously, that's what, if you want to be the best at something, you have to make sacrifices. And I was unwilling to leave Hanover High School. I was unwilling to leave my friends, and I'm really stubborn. So I said no. Money was also part of that concern, but I wanted to stay where I was. It had worked that far, and I was determined to make it work, continue to work. So for the rest of my 
skiing career, I should say the rest of my high school career, I stayed in high school. I had to photocopy a lot of textbooks and bring them on the road with me. I also communicated with my teachers, I told them how important this was to me and got their support and their blessing to go on the road and send, uh, hand in assignments a little bit late, but I always made up my work. I played track, I was a jumper because that was the best cross training for skiing. And I played soccer. Is there anyone from Sauhegan in here? <laughs> Boo. <laughs> we won two state championships, but the other two years, Sauhegan took us down early in the playoffs. I loved those sports. These, as I said, were my teams, and they were my training for the sport that I was definitely better at, which was skiing. Um, and so, um, in turn, I balanced track, soccer, um, and skiing with my schoolwork, which I mentioned I took seriously, probably a little bit too seriously. So in 2004, when I graduated, I had a 3.97 GPA and I was a national champion in the sport of mogul skiing. That sounds really glamorous and easy as a title, but it was a ton of hard work. And I definitely made sacrifices. And I have some regrets. I didn't have very much fun in high school, in the actual high school building. Every single free period I had, I went to a cubicle in the back of the library and wouldn't let anyone talk to me. I certainly didn't leave campus and go grab lunch with my friends. I just did the schoolwork that I was behind on or I was trying to catch up on because I knew I was going to be leaving again for another ski competition. As you can imagine, that puts a lot of pressure. I put a lot of pressure on myself during those times and it was tough to balance and I don't have a formula for how I got through it all. I definitely shed some tears. I definitely had sleepless nights, but for me, it was, I was unwilling to give anything less than 100% of my attention, and so I wasn't gonna hand in a paper I thought was subpar, because I was worried that if I even put a little less effort into that one paper, maybe then that would, I would start to just do everything a little less intensely, and I would just become a worse person overall. So that was not an option, and it was exhausting. And so when I graduated, I did not apply to college, I needed a break. I was completely burnt out. I think that's why gap years exist now, to be honest. Just a recovery period. But for me, it, wasn't a, it was not a gap year. It was, my theory was that I was going to go to the 2006 Olympics and win a gold medal. But I had lost all my training. I was no longer a high school track athlete or a soccer player. And so I was not in very good condition and, good, and strong when I qualified for the 2006 Olympics. But it was a fun time to celebrate, and Norb Vermont sent me off from the bandstand where I, four years before, had played the trumpet to send someone else off to the Olympics. It was an Olympic ski jumper in a hometown where one in every 222 people are a winter Olympic, actually an Olympian. Um, it seems normal for someone to go to the Olympics, and I believe that in 1998, sending someone off to the Olympics made me realize, okay, you can grow up here and go on to the Olympics. And so it didn't seem that peculiar. So just in case that actually um, is true, just keep in mind, you can do it. I did it, why don't you guys? And when I got sent off though, all of a sudden it made the Olympics seem like a way bigger deal. And I was not really prepared to handle that pressure. So what came across as a really nice gesture, this amazing send off, they all cheered for me and we played the national anthem and it was fanfare, it was a celebration, but it put a lot of pressure on me because now I thought, yes, I'm representing the United States, but more personally, I'm representing my hometown and everyone's gonna be watching TV on the first night of the 2006 Olympics. And I, took that pressure and internalized it. And I had knots in my stomach, physical knots in my stomach because I didn't handle it well. I tried to look at it, my theory, if I just ski, treat it like any other competition, same competitors, the same mogul course, same judges, I'll just focus on my skiing and uh, that should be fine. I've won competitions of this caliber before, I should be fine. I just assumed I could win because I had won other competitions. Well, that's not what the Olympics are about and all the attention and the media and the sponsorships and the fact that all the countries are there at one time. It was not like any other competition. And needless to say, I did terribly. I made a mistake, three, run, three bumps into my first run and it was over. I got third to last place. And I remember my first thought was, I was embarrassed. I thought I had disappointed everyone in the United States Obviously, that's too much pressure to handle, and everyone in Norwich. But guess what? I woke up in the morning, and life went on. No one was treating me any differently. When I got back home to Norwich, everyone's response was, congratulations, how was it? Nothing like, wow, that was terrible. You embarrassed us. And, and that realization, it sounds ridiculous, but that is genuinely how I felt. And the way I got through it was by living 
through it and realizing that is not how people felt. So that pressure that I felt that they were putting on me was actually self-inflicted pressure. And by failing and surviving four years later, I had far less pressure. I had nothing to lose and I knew that no matter what happened, win or lose, life was going to go on. I was still Hannah, I still lived in the same place, everything about me was still the same. But in the meantime, in those four years, four years is a long time to wait after something bad happens and you want some redemption. But the time passed quickly because I tore my knee. In the sport like mogul skiing, you saw that absorption happening. You can easily tear an ACL, and that's exactly what I did. So I returned to Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, and I had a knee surgery. And we'll not linger on this slide too long. But this is four days after his knee surgery, and it goes to show that you're gonna, it's a slow process to come back from knee injury, injury to get from this point of gross swelling and lack of strength back to an elite level of competition. And so during this process, I once again asked for help, and I got a lot of it. Not only did the doctor repair my knee, but the um, physical therapist I worked with, again at DHMC, the US ski team strength coaches, um, all helped me come back as a much stronger, better and more mature athlete. Through the process of coming back from an injury, I also learned to really understand and love the training. And with almost any sport at an elite level, you spend more time training than you do actually competing. Mogul run is about 30 seconds. You compete once a week for maybe 10 weeks a year. That's it. That's not very many minutes. You math whizzes, what is that, five minutes of competing? And the rest of the year, you're training. So if you don't love the training, probably not gonna be a successful athlete. And through this process, I learned to love it. And I learned how to set goals and measure my success, track my progress, and I found that incredibly motivating. So I came back a better athlete. I also had the advantage of knowing um, what failure meant and how I was gonna do everything completely differently um, four years later. So in 2010, I packed only red, white, and blue clothing, embraced the Olympic spirit, and I knew that no matter what was gonna happen, I was gonna be okay. When I woke up on the morning of my event in Vancouver, it was pouring rain and I had a bit of a headache. And I thought, this is not how you imagine your Olympic experience going. But then, then I thought about the rain and how most of my competitors were probably really bummed about the rain, but I was from New England and that was not gonna be a problem for me. And so this unfolded on that day. You more right now, your top three competitors with the number one qualifier, Hannah Carney set to drop in. The 23-year-old from Norwich, Vermont, looking for a bit of redemption when she did not qualify for the final four years ago in Torino. Your final competitor in Women's Moguls Final. Will it be Hannah Carney or Jen Heil taking home the gold? Clean so far off the top and watch this middle section all week flawless. Ripping this middle section. So powerful and so tight. Oh, look at the hands, Johnny. She is in the hands. zone. She is in the zone. Oh, and that's the heli she needed. She made one small mistake on that in qualifications. It still was in force, and that's the fastest time. She has the whole package. The tards. The time. Okay, I mentioned that I believe in setting goals. Well, that piece of paper was in my pocket on that night. So I think there's scientific evidence that if you write it down, it's 100% gonna come true. <laughs> Something like that, give or take a few percentages. So of course, when I achieved that goal, I had another now what moment. I didn't really plan past this moment. All of my energy had been focused on winning a gold medal. And then I did it, and I was like, oh, geez. So I went back, and a few days later, after some crazy experiences, meeting Wayne Gretzky, going on the Today Show, getting a call to throw at the first pitch for the Red Sox, after I had a second to breathe, I watched that run from the front with the view the judges see, and my backflip was crooked. And I was like, all right, well, I can't retire. I'm, I gotta fix that. <laughs> I also need to get an education because I'm 23, all my other friends are graduating from college and I haven't even started. So I wrote an essay, my college essay, about winning a gold medal. I highly recommend it. It helps you get into college. <laughs> other, other tip. Uh, if you want to win a gold medal, choose a weird sport not that many people do, like mogul skiing, makes it also makes it easier. I got accepted to Dartmouth and I started, instead of a gap year, I took seven years off. I do not recommend that. 
going back to school was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And, it was, and I was still putting pressure on myself to get, get good grades, but I was rusty. And so it was a very challenging <laughs> transition. But I, but I was much more familiar with the sport, so the goal I set to fix that backflip became my obsession. And for the next four years, every summer, I made it a goal to do at least 1,000 of those backflips into a pool of water uh, in Lake Placid, New York. So between trampoline training and water ramp training, I, I um, did. I fixed my, I'd say about five degrees less crooked. Totally worth it. And in that, because of that training and that focus, that was the streak when I won 16 competitions in a row and Crystal Globes, which are not an Olympic medal, but they're the season end title. So for me, it was the success that from consistency. Not anyone can win the Olympics, that's patronizing, but it's one day of competition. Winning a Crystal Globe is day after day of competing. So for me, that was my reward for the hard training I was doing. Uh, year in and year out. In 2014, my last Olympic Games, I went in as the number one skier in the world, and of course my goal was to be the first person to win two gold medals back to back in consecutive Olympics. But I made a huge mistake, and I got a bronze. And it absolutely felt like a broken heart. And I may never forgive myself for that, just like that A- in high school. But if you can win a bronze medal on a day when you make a mistake, I now look at that medal as my reward for being a way stronger, mentally and physically, athlete than I was four years before. And so that, that bronze medal was my reward for staying on my feet, regaining my composure, and making it across that finish line. So when I retired in 2015, I brought with me all the lessons I learned along the way, and I believe the character that was instilled in me from growing up here in New England. So after 13 years on the ski team and over 100 World Cups, of which, yes, I may have won 46, but there, that's way less than half of them that I didn't win. <laughs> I've learned a million lessons um, from those sports, but that leaves me now, where am I? I did graduate with a degree in marketing just last May, so it, it took me a while. <laughs> but I, but I, I'm gonna say, I, uh, excuse me, I achieved that goal, get an education, because that was on my list. So uh, I'm in a, mo in a point in my life that I think you guys can relate to. I am really excited and absolutely terrified for whatever comes next. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. And I think we have some time for questions. If you guys are interested, this is, these are my handles, is that what they are? These are my social media handles. That picture of the dog is just a preview if you uh, bother following my Instagram account, it's just going to be photos of my dog. <laughs> but if you want to reach out, thank you so much for coming out today. And yeah, if you have any questions about, I don't know why you'd have questions about high school in New Hampshire, you guys are already living it, but any questions about uh, the Olympics or school or pressure or decisions, I am happy to answer them. Thank you. And to spice up this, uh, the Q&A portion, in case you don't have any, I brought the medals and we'll just pass them around. Take a selfie, do whatever you need to do.